title this morning, What a Soldier Did for Us. And we're going to see as a American soldier has done so much for us, but even more importantly, what God, especially sending his son to the die for us, what Jesus has done for us. So let's just read John chapter 3, verse 16, the most familiar verse, I'm sure, in the Bible. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Lord, we're coming this morning just asking you to speak to our hearts, um, just speak to us through this service, and uh, we thank you for all you've done for us, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that you've uh, given us men and women that were so brave to uh, die for us, and we also pray for those who are still on the, the battlefield today fighting for us in different ways, uh, that you'll just... Uh, uh, be with them. We'll give them safety, and uh, we'll just pray that they'll come back home to us safely. In Jesus' name, amen. Since several wars throughout U.S. history, some more well-known than others, uh, the Revolutionary War, we had over 4,400 deaths in. And of course, we were not as big back then, and so that's actually been some of the, one of the wars with some of the fewer deaths that we've had. But over 4,000 died in that. In the Civil War, almost 500,000, almost half a million died in the Civil War. <coughs> the bloodiest conflict in American history is when we fought each other. World War I, over 100,000 uh, U.S. military deaths. World War II, again, almost half a million, over, a little over 400,000. And then you go on the Korean War, had about 50,000. Vietnam, about 90,000. And even to, today, the war on terror, Almost 5,000 have died protecting our freedoms. The total number of Americans killed in all the United States wars more than 1.1 million people. So many have died to preserve our freedom. We have so much to be thankful for on this weekend. The, most, the deadliest battle in U.S. history was the Argonne Forest in World War I. There were over 26,000 deaths. I think that's including both sides, but there was over 26,000 deaths. And the, that compares to the deadliest battle of the Civil War, Gettysburg, 7,000 deaths of the Union and Confederate <coughs> soldiers. And so we see have all these people, and they've died for our freedom. First, a point I make is we see a soldier died for us. John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that if you believe in him... You will not perish, but you're going to have everlasting life. And as a soldier, an American soldier has died for us, but we see God sent his very own son to die on the cross for our sins. <coughs> One of the most famous battles in history, especially American history, is the uh, D-Day there at Normandy. As so those soldiers rushed onto that beach and many of them were, were like sitting ducks there and not a whole lot that they could do so that first wave just the Germans were beating them down with the machine guns and I read a book and it was an interesting book and it was from the Germans viewpoint of D-Day and they said we actually felt sorry for them because of what they were doing and we felt they were just running into a bloodbath and nothing was going to happen well, he said they didn't feel sorry anymore when those tanks got on the beach and all the weaponry got on the beach. And I had never heard this before, but he said up until this point, wars were fought on horses. Just like you see in World War One, they fought a lot on horses. But when he saw that machinery on that beach, he said, now the Americans have the upper hand. You know, we, we've had a great amount of people working here back home, and they did what they could do to get all those tanks and airplanes and ships ready that we could win that war. But many of these men ran onto this beach, you know, with hardly a, a chance, especially since the first ones that went out. And they went up and they fought for our loved ones back home. They, I'm sure many of them had in their mind their mom, their dad, maybe even their wife, maybe even their kids. And thinking, I am fighting for their freedom. I am fighting for them. But you know, we were on Christ's mind when he 
was on the cross. You know, he said, you know, I am dying right now for Aaron Crawford, for Wayne Rice, for each and every one of you. And you may think, well, there's no way he thought of all that. Well, he's God. I can about guarantee you that every person went through his head and he said, I am dying for them. We were on his mind. He gave up his life for us. And it just says all these soldiers, over one million, have died for us in American history. Jesus gave up his life for us. He hadn't done anything. We, he had not done anything wrong, but we had. And he paid for our wrong. It's just like a lot of these soldiers, and it's not a perfect example, but they haven't done anything wrong for these wars. But some evil person has done something they're having to pay for it. Jesus has paying for what we have done. He is paying for that. He loved us too much to let us go to hell. People say a loving God could not send us to hell, but they're looking at it all wrong. A loving God sent his son to die for us so that we do not have to go to hell. And he died for the world, but many have not accepted. They've shunned him They've cast them out. You know, many countries that they're all maybe Muslim, they're all Buddhist, they don't want anything with Jesus, and we're starting that way in our country, shoving him out as well. But they have not accepted the gift that was paid for them. His life for mine, as the song says, it was a great trade for us. His life for us. A terrible thing, though, for Jesus to go through. Just as we have this day that we set aside and we think about Memorial Day as we remember these lives that died for us, we need to think about Jesus who died for us. And we should honor him daily. You know, it's sad that we just have this one day that we think about those who died for us, Memorial Day. We don't really think about it every day, but we should. We should also think about the sacrifice Jesus has given to us every day. Not just one day a year, not just on Easter or maybe on Good Friday, but we need to remember what he's done for us daily. All we have to do is believe in him, and he has come to give us salvation. A soldier died for us. Secondly, a soldier died for our freedom. A few chapters over, John chapter 8, and down in verse 36. <coughs> John 8 and verse 36 died for our freedom. It says, What manner of thing is this that he said, Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. He died for our freedom. We're only free through Christ. And we, we kind of uh, see this uh, story here. And uh, he says that for our, our freedom here, he says, I've died to make you free. If you free, you shall be free indeed. We're only free through Christ. Only through Jesus Christ are we free. He gives us freedom forever. You know, a soldier has given us freedom for a, a, a certain amount of time. And he's given us that freedom, but we're free forever through Christ. We enjoy great freedom in America, but nothing like Christ gives us. Yes, we have freedom in America, and we have liberty, but Christ has given us freedom over sin. He's given us freedom so we don't have to worry about our afterlife. We are free. We are free indeed. We, we were enslaved to sin before, but now Christ has made us free. We were slaves to Satan. We were slaves to his dominion. And Christ has made us free. I was thinking just a, a few minutes ago, we were talking about World War II. Uh, when they, you know, we all know about the Holocaust now. But they, during World War II, they didn't know a lot about that. 
they, they were fighting for freedom. They didn't know a lot of all those, about those concentration camps and stuff. And when the war was over and they went to some of these concentration camps, they couldn't believe what they had seen. And although they, they discovered the showers and stuff where they were, were killing them by, by gas and discovered all that was going on, these people were in captivity by the Nazis. And many people are in captivity by Satan. Satan has them in their grip. Satan had us in his grip. And we just blindly follow him. And Satan has us enslaved. When we're, when we're not saved, before we accept Christ as Savior, we can't help but sin. Christ, though, is our deliverer from that life. He keeps us from that life. That all that we know is that life until Christ sets us free. He makes us free. And if we're free by Christ, we are free indeed. We were enslaved, but Christ gives us freedom. And then I see a soldier left his home for us. John chapter 6 and verse 38. John chapter 6 and verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. He came down from heaven to do the will of the Father. A soldier has left his home for us. You know, every soldier, they, they get called off to, you know, whether it just be back in the days had the draft, and or, you know, you just go to begin with, or then you also go to war. But either way, a soldier left his home. <coughs> For us, our grand, my grandfather was in World War II. Uh, most of it, I was leaving the, the Philippines, but either way, in the Pacific Theater. And uh, he told us a few years ago that when he went off to that war, and of course he had to cross the ocean to get there on that on that ship, the but biggest body of water he'd ever seen before that was the French Broad River. Then all of a sudden, he's on a big ocean. He left his home for us. My <clears throat> uncle Marvin, who lived here in Marshall, uh, he'd be uh, both the uh, mom and Dwayne's uncle, um, he fought in the, the Battle of the Bulge. As most of us know, it was a, a, a terrible battle there in World War II, and a lot of frostbite happened, and a lot of snow, and many people died. He never did like to talk a lot about it. He left his peaceful home in Marshall to go to a place of, of gunfire, of people dying, of blood. He left our peaceful home they have left for us. And Jesus left the comforts of heaven for us. Jesus as the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he, he was over everything, he is over everything, and he's there in heaven, he's sitting on his throne, and he comes to earth as a lowly baby, as a person who's going to be beaten, you know, spit upon, put upon a cross for something he didn't do, and he left all the comforts of heaven for that. You know, I don't know exactly what heaven is like. The Bible gives us some indication, especially in Revelation. But some things that we do know, we do know that there's fruit trees. And I don't know about about you, but, you know, some people don't like vegetables and stuff as far as eating healthy, but fruit most people like. And you, you hear about those fruit trees and you look forward to heaven about that great fruit that there's going to be. You know, I, I heard the other day that there's a new apple that has been developed. There's a, it's similar to the honey crisp, and it's called a, something else crisp. I don't remember the name of it now. But they're putting big money into this apple. They said Red Delicious has kind of fallen off. Not many people buy it anymore. And uh, I think Honeycrisp and stuff like that is popular now. But this apple is <coughs> crisper in taste. It lasts longer so it doesn't go bad so quickly. And so they're putting a lot of money into making this new kind of apple. I guarantee you the apples in heaven are going to be the crispest apples there's ever been. 
<laughs> they're not going to go bad. Have you ever taken a bite of an apple? It does not take it long for it to start turning bad. They're, they're not going to go bad. You ever buy a, a banana at this store? And the first day you get them, generally you can't eat them. And then they're, they're good for a couple of days, <laughs> and then they're bad. They don't last hardly any time. I guarantee you the bananas in heaven won't be like that. There's all, you know, there's this food there. There's these streets of gold. He leaves these streets of gold to come and, and walk on gravel. And they didn't have great roads back then, probably you know, a little few stones and stuff like that. And he leaves all of that. And he leaves them praising him in heaven and all of that to come to this earth where they complain about him healing a blind man. They complain that he heals these people in not exactly the way that they'd like for him to heal them. And he leaves the comfort of heaven to come to earth for all of that so that he could die for our sins. He came to this earth that's full of pain, full of death, Full of suffering. Something we don't think about much. And we don't know for sure as far as the Bible doesn't tell us. But it's believed that Mary's husband, uh, Joseph, died. And was not there. He had already died before Jesus died. So Jesus had experienced suffering. He had experienced death as someone very close to him. <coughs> Yet he came to this earth because he loved us so much. He died for us. He goes to a place that did not want him there. And that still does not want him here. And he still loves us. And he still, no matter what somebody may say about him their whole life, if they ever accept him, he still accepts them. They could talk bad about him their whole life. They could spend their whole life trying to discredit him. Yet, he died for them. There's been people who have written books who have went out to discredit Jesus and ended up finding Jesus through that. And they, Jesus still accepts them no matter what. He left his home even though that we don't always care about him, but he left his home and died for us. Also we see a soldier isn't loved by everyone. John chapter 7 verse 5 for neither did his brethren believe in him. And that's not the only example that we could give. There's two people, kinds of people that we've seen over time that did not love a soldier. First was the enemy. As much as we love our soldiers, the enemy does not. And the world and Satan hate Jesus. We see that his brothers even did not believe in him. And we see it time and time again, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they come and they always, you know, against Jesus. We see Satan come and he tempts Jesus. He is against him. The world hates Jesus. He shows them their faults. It was kind of mentioned at Sunday school this morning that, you know, the Christians are getting pushed away today, but, you know, Muslims are being coming, well, we accept you. It's because Jesus gets to their heart and tells them they're wrong. People don't want to be told that they're wrong. They don't want to know that they're wrong. But guess what? If you're driving on the wrong side of the road and a cop pulls you over and tells you you're wrong, you're on the wrong side of the road, guess what? He's protecting you. And God says, you're wrong for doing this because he's protecting you. First, those rules are, those commandments in the Bible are generally there to help us. Secondly, he does not want us to go to hell. Right. Jesus is not loved by the enemy. He's not loved by the world. But he came for them anyways. Right. Secondly, sometimes he's not loved by his own people. An example I have that of 
the soldiers, do you remember the soldiers of Vietnam came back? Riding in the streets and you know throwing things at them, calling them baby killers and stuff like that. Sometimes a soldier isn't even loved by their own people, and neither was Jesus. His own people, the Jews, did not want him. And we see a, a great correlation there. But you know, sometimes we act like we don't love Christ when we sin. We put other things first. We say what we're telling him is we love that thing more than you, God. We love this more than you. And sometimes we even do that. We have to be careful when we're not intentionally going against Christ. When we're sinning, we go against Christ. And we we don't want to. It's not a desire but we naturally tend to sin. And we do the very thing that we don't want to do, and we unintentionally hurt Jesus. So we need to show Christ our love. We need to show it. We also, it also helps to tell him. We need to tell him we love him. Don't you like when somebody tells you that they love you? And if Jesus, of course, knows everything about us, and he knows our thoughts and our feelings. But I think it's good to tell him we love him. And thank him for what he's done for us. But it's not just words. Our actions matter. It's not just saying that we love him, but showing him that we love him. We could tell our spouse that we love them every single day, but if we never do anything for them, never help them, Always berate them. Always put them down. Those words aren't going to mean a whole lot without some action. The Bible tells us to obey is better than sacrifice. So to show Christ we love him is better than to come and say we love you. We're going to give you this gift. You know, sometimes we try to do that in our spouse or even our kids. We don't want to show them our actions. We don't want to tell them but we just bring them a gift. If I give you this gift, that'll make everything okay. <coughs> but to obey is better than sacrifice. Show Christ your love. And lastly, a soldier died for peace. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to rip it down at verse 20. A soldier died for peace. Ultimately, that's what a soldier wants, is peace. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, And having made peace through the blood of his Christ, by him to reconcile all things to themselves, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. There was a, a group of people that were popularized by a, a book and a, a miniseries uh, called Easy Company. And they would end up being the ones that would go into what they called the hornet's nest. And that was Hitler's own kind of um, kind of headquarters lined up in the mountains. Kind of, I guess, a safe place that he stayed at. And they'd be the ones that end up going in there and taking that place over. And there's a, there's a picture of them. It's a, it's a classic picture of them sitting there in Hitler's own place that he would have sit outside with this great view of the mountain sitting there that they've taken over it and drinking drinks you know doing whatever they want to do in Hitler's own place and I, when I saw that picture the other day I thought what a great feeling that must have been to know that we have taken over this this evil uh, this, this evil dictator we've taken over and we are sitting in the place that he was sitting and we are here now. Ultimately, that's what soldiers are there for. For peace. We don't celebrate it as much anymore, but you had, you know, Victory Over Europe Day, Victory Over Japan Day, when the, when the peace finally came. You're celebrating in the streets for peace. And ultimately, Jesus wants us to have peace. 
has made peace through the blood of his cross. Of course, there's peace, ultimate peace, that we have heaven awaiting us. How in the world could you ever have peace not knowing what happens after this life? When we were on the way back home from the beach yesterday, we ran up on this accident that had apparently just happened, and we read about it later that there was uh, two cars and a motorcycle involved in it, and there were two people laying on the road. You know, I'm assuming they were the motorcycle riders, and uh, all, all bloody and stuff. You know, you know things you know like that happen sometimes, and you know and, and stuff like that. But ultimately, what happens to us when something like that happens, and if we're on the brink of eternity, where do we go? You know, we could we could worry about all that. If I if I ride this motorcycle and you know I turn over or something and, and I die, what's going to happen to me? Or we can say I know, and I know where I'm going, right? And that's heaven. Ultimately, that is peace. How can we ever have peace if we don't know where we're going? Peace does not come by bombs, but it eventually, ultimately comes by Christ. And yes, there's, you know, in between us, we have to have war and stuff as far as if there's evil, we, we can't just let it run rampant, but it, ultimately it comes by Christ. Only through Christ can true peace happen. We're going to have wars and wars and wars till Christ comes back. And when Christ rules, the Bible tells us that's when lambs and lions can lay together. There will be peace. And that's what it's all about, is peace. If we'd only, though, let Christ rule the day. But we don't. Instead, we let Satan rule, you know, and, and things end up happening. You know, it's just like last week, that, that bombing in Manchester, England, at that concert... Ultimately, yes, there was a guy, I think Salman Abidi, you know, that, that did that. You know, ultimately, who's behind that is Satan. He doesn't care if he uses Islam. He doesn't care if he uses atheism. He doesn't care if he uses Buddhism. He can do anything to keep people from Christ. And if he can create havoc, that's all that he cares about. But if we let God rule, we'd have peace. The world needs to find its way to Christ. Christ is the answer. You know, we have temporary things we can do to try to keep terrorism from happening, but ultimately God is the answer. The Department of Homeland Security said the other day, he said, if Americans knew what I know, they would not walk outside their door every day. There is so much evil in this world, the Department of Homeland Security cannot possibly stop everything. The only hope for this world is Christ. We need Christ. We need more Christ. A soldier died for peace. In conclusion, when you kind of think of Memorial Day, you kind of one of the things you can think about when they memorialize people was Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. One of the great addresses in history was only 272 words long. It only lasted about two minutes. You know, it started four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all men are created equal. Simple to the point, and he honored those people. One something we forget about, though, is there's another man there, Edward Everett, who gave a much longer speech. Lincoln was about two, out, two minutes, his was about two hours. You know, and he made a big to-do and did all this. It was 14,000 words. 
<coughs> and he started off not as simple as Lincoln's, but he said, standing beneath this serene sky, overlooking these broad fields, now reposing from the labors and of the waning year, and started off all this flowery words, and it was kind of about himself. But you know what made Lincoln and Edward's speech different, and why we remember Lincoln's? Because Lincoln's was about those men who had died there, not about the speaker. And Memorial Day is not about us, but it's about those who have died for us. You know, ultimately, it's not about us, <coughs> but it's about Jesus who died for us. It's the actions of Christ coming to this earth and dying for us. And yes, we are the vessels and we go out and we tell people, but ultimately that's what makes the difference is Christ. And this Memorial Day weekend, we definitely want to remember those who have died for us as America's soldiers, but we also want to remember Jesus and what he has given. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's want to come to the piano.